Eco-fascism, that is the topic of tonight's byline. Last night I had trouble sleeping, and it all comes down to the frightening stories in this book, Eco-Fascist. The book from author Elizabeth Nixon is subtitled How Radical Cons Conservationists Are Destroying Our Natural Heritage. Nixon tells her own story of trying to simply subdivide her own land and the high cost, hoops, and soul-killing process she had to go through. From costly environmental assessments to putting part of her property under a perpetual land trust to installing a contraption to help salmon breed in a creek that hasn't seen salmon in a long time, if ever. All this to be able to build a second home on her 28 acres. This experience sent Elizabeth Nixon on a journey. The former London bureau chief for Time magazine back in the 1980s, the longtime columnist and investigative reporter, began looking into why environmental groups had so much power, why property owners had less say about how their land could be used than local officials and environmental charities. What she found will scare you, and I will tell you, this book is more than a, more than a must read. This is a must study and share with your family and friends kind of book. But what you'll find out in here is it'll put the meat on the bones to the stories of intrusive government power we've talked about. It also connects the dots between funding groups we've discussed on this program, like the Tides Foundation and the environmental groups that have partnered with governments for what seem like good ideas, but in reality are an affront to our way of life. Let me give you an example. There are attempts to conserve land right across North America, and governments on both sides of the border and at all levels have signed on to be partners. I mean, who could be against conserving land? Sounds like a good thing. The Harper government's been a major sponsor of this sort of thing. Think of the, the Great Bay Area rainforest in British Columbia or the protection of large swaths of land in the Arctic. But what's the end game? Well, for some environmentalists, it really is to take humans out of the equation. It's a plan for rewilding North America, and it's gaining traction in environmental circles. I'll show you some maps about this in a minute and tell you what they want to do. Now, some people will say these maps and the ideas that go with them are crazy and that only a madman would believe it's a possible plan. Well, mark my words, unless people become aware of this and push back, within five years, those of us who think this is a bad idea, well, we'll all be called Luddites, backwards, anti-environmental for not supporting this. Let me tell you about the first one. It's, it's the Algonquin to Adirondack Corridor. This is a cross-border initiative to lock up 80 million acres in an area that includes Ottawa, Kingston, and stretches down to Burlington, Vermont. What's the goal? Ecological purity, roadless corridors, no mineral rights, no water rights for the landowner. Your land becomes their land. This, and there's others like it across North America, in, in, including the Yukon, or sorry, Yellowstone to Yukon Corridor. It takes in parts of the Yukon, Alberta, British Columbia, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Oregon, and even Washington. The final goal is to, well, for many, is to have huge tracts of land that humans just don't set foot on. It's the ultimate rewilding plan to constrain human activity. This will change what you can do with your home, your cottage, your family farm, the land your business sits on. If your land is in these areas or buffers on it, it's going to change everything. It will be sold to us as a good thing. It's all about protecting the land. It's not a good thing. We've told you about Agenda 21 before, the ridiculously named United Nations plan for working with local government to implement a, a radical environmental agenda. It'll strip away property rights. Everything I've described so far tonight is part of that. Ecofascists is a book that will take the idea of Agenda 21 and put a scary face on it. We'll be talking more about this over the coming weeks because you need to be armed with the facts and you need to fight back. And that's the byline. Joining me now for a further discussion on this is Elizabeth Nixon. She joins us from her home on Salt Spring Island, where perhaps there are people outside uh, demanding environmental assessments for your internet connection. Elizabeth, good to speak with you. <laughs> nice to talk to you, Brian. And you certainly have a really good grasp on the subject, I have to say. I'm oh, impressed. Th thank you. We've been following this for a little while. And, and what I love about your book is that as we've tried to, to say something concrete and talk to people in a concrete way about Agenda 21, about the sustainable development movement, there's a lot of um, talk up there in the clouds and, and theoretical things. Yours is very concrete. So yeah. help us walk through your story quickly. You, this started with you trying to subdivide your land, as I said, and, and then how many hoops did you have to go through? 
Well, um, I bought the land when I was working in London for Time magazine, and I paid on it for 10 years uh, before I moved here. And I moved just when I could work from home because there, the Internet had matured to that level. And I bought the land with a friend, um, uh, and he had a stroke at the age of 39, and he needed his money out of the land, by which time it, the, it the value it just skyrocketed. So the only way I could pay him was by slicing off a chunk of it and selling it. Um, and I, so basically, it took me 22 months. It cost $160,000. I hired five lawyers, four engineers, three surveyors, and I went to every meeting on the island for 22 months. I walked up and down my dirt roads and pleaded with my neighbors. I uh, uh, produced <laughs> document after document saying that what I was doing was environmentally sound, which, by the way, I wanted to do. I, I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't a Luddite. I think some of these ideas are fine. Um, and I covenanted half of my forest and ravine, and I built a sam salmon enhancement project, neither of which was um, legally required, um, but made it possible for the trust, the Islands Trust, to approve this this maneuver. And then I built a greenhouse. Um, it's rammed earth. It's heated by geothermal. It's very, very healthy. It's a healthy house. It's a okay. fantastic house to live in. But the whole exercise, it cost over a million dollars. And it, had I not sold my old house at the top of um, a, the a once in a millennium real estate boom, I would have been bankrupted. Um, which is the point of green? It's good, but it's going to take a hundred years to integrate these ideas sensibly. When they're forced, they cause economic decline and um, deflation. And uh, it, let, let's talk about some of the uh, the things that you found because this sent you on a real journey, and you went through the heartland of America. And those of us in the East, we hear about preserving the forests of, uh, of, of British Columbia and the Rockies areas. And you went into some of the towns that, uh, where they have decided that this is a good thing and found out that they lost all their uh, forestry jobs. Yeah. Uh, people are losing, uh, moving out of town. The towns are dying. But yeah. the forests that they wanted to protect are dying off as well. And I, I that was the most shocking thing that I found in I your book. I didn't realize the forests were dying. Yeah, that, I think that is perhaps the only original thing that I advance, although it's based on pretty serious audits of the forests and ranges of America. After Clinton shut down the western forest for the spotted owl, that forest grows four times as fast as any other forest in the world. And so after 25 years, we can actually audit forest health. The movement has uh, uh, litigates anybody who wants to cut um, a block of trees and and even maintenance is forbidden so you're not even allowed to go into the forest to um, ram seeds into the soil to cause new growth or clear brush or anything like that so what's happened is instead of 60 to 80 healthy trees in an acre they're now four or five hundred um, malnourished uh, pest infested root rotting trees that are at risk the forest service itself estimates of uh, a catastrophic ca canopy fire from California to Alaska, uh, 200 million acres that will go up in 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 a in a apocalyptic kind of thing that will even scarify the soil, so no seeds survive. That's how dangerous. And, um, and this is this is part of that corridor. Yes, uh, it is. I, I would imagine exactly. that you write about the the Yellowstone to Yukon, and, and in eastern North America, we've got uh, the other one, the. Uh, Algonquin to Adirondack, but then as you read more, you find out they want to extend it even further. So the, th this really is about saying humans shouldn't be in certain areas, or if they are, their activity should be severely limited. I, I think that goes beyond what most people's idea of sustainable development is. Yes, it, it, the movement has turned sociopathic. It, it doesn't like humans, and it wants to restrict us as much as possible because they, it thinks that any human impact is bad. Well, I advance, and many people advance, an alternate theory that humans, in most cases, create gardens out of, um, the, uh, out of the earth, and wilderness is not 
as beautiful as we all, all us urbanites, have been led to believe. Some of it is gorgeous, but a lot of it is tangled weed and 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 sick animals and uh, um, just clogged. I mean, there's, some of these forests are so clogged that bear and wolves are driven down into the human communities looking for food. So it's become actually dangerous to live in these dying towns. All of those towns are are dying. They can't meet their civic pension obligations, their hospitals are leaving. Um, these resource jobs that were eliminated by Clinton are, are like gold in the country. And, and we estimate that more than 40 million people have been displaced by the environmental movement since 1980 because wow. of overregulation. And my figures were checked by a think tank in, um, in Washington who sent uh, my research to the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, who has its own statistics institute, and they went through them and said I'd, it, I'd done a very good job, um, but that uh, I'd undercounted. So in fact, You'd undercounted, so 40 I'd million. I'd undercounted. Uh, I'd Elizabeth, undercounted. I, I, I have to cut us off here, and perhaps we'll have you on again uh, when we can get you into a studio in, in Vancouver next okay. time. But uh, I want to thank you for your book uh, and recommend that everyone pick it up, especially if you are having trouble with, uh, with land use regulations, with environmental groups. I, I know the landowners here in eastern Ontario, where I live, would be fascinated by these stories. Elizabeth Nixon is the author of Eco Fascist. Email me your story, your thoughts, byline at sunmedia.ca.